Okay, everyone. Good morning or afternoon, I guess. <laughs> Welcome back. Anyway, uh, hope you had a good weekend. And we have like three minutes to go until we start the uh, first part of our review sessions this week. So hope you're doing well and that uh, you're having a good semester overall as we head into the last couple of meetings in the last weeks. Uh, feel free to just leave behind any kind of chat, comment anytime. And I'll be right ready to start with you guys in just a couple minutes. <clears throat> One second, I'm going to grab myself my like, uh, canteen. I'll be right back. Hello everyone. Hi Tina, Mia, Maria. Hope things are going good. Alicia, Kevin, how's it going? <clears throat> and Moises. Uh, no, Maria, not to worry about that. Um, I've been, I was teaching just now from 1 to 2.15. When did you send me your paper? I think I've uh, given responses, but only up until earlier this morning. Um, so if you just have sent it in, I might not have yet had a chance, but um, let me know. When did yours come in? I can just verify for you right now while we're together. Um, <clears throat> yes, 12.21 p.m. That's from you. I've got it. Yeah, so like I was saying, I, um, I just had office hours, and I had a lot of students coming, and then I taught from 1 to 2.15 a different class. But I'm certainly going to send a confirmation to everybody um, before right too long. But right after this class is over, I'll finish with the last few. Um, so I just now sent yours, your confirmation, Maria. But to anybody else that's waiting for me uh, to send it, like, for example, isn't that you, Spencer, down there? You're going to get your reply in short order. Um, I just, you know, I've been kind of preoccupied this morning. But um, not to worry, I'll certainly confirm them all. Thank you, guys. Okay, perfect. And uh, David, you're asking the same question. I'm sure that I did. So it seems like some of you guys are a little. Yeah, you sent yours at 11:10 a.m. I see it right here. Um, so no, not to worry about that. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the exact time signature of the last uh, response. So I was all the way up until 10:45 a.m. Um, Sarah uh, Jagerhorn. I replied to you, and then Anthony Sanchez, you're 1101, Yvonne Solis, 1108, David, 1110, Caleb, 11, well, that's a different class, sorry, Kristen Ochoa, 1134, um, da, 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 River Salcedo, it's 1205, um, Ivan Villacorta, 1206, Spencer Castling, 1216 p.m., uh, Gabriela Cervantes Camacho, 1217. Alexa Garza, no, that's a different class, thanks. Maria, talked about you. Angelina, have yours. Um, Derek Brown, um, Alan Kernan, Mia Fuentes, uh, and let's see, Sylvia Zuniga, got yours. Maybelline Flores, Litsy Alvarado, Ruby uh, Zamaripa. Diego Cano, Isabella Paredes, Kim Nguyen, Gaz, uh, sorry, different class, Kevin Castilla, Daniel Phillips, Emily Tran, Carson Humphrey, Jasmine Moscoro, Ashley Gomez. So I just said um, the names of all those that I have yet to reply to but that are in my inbox waiting for me to confirm right after class. So um, I think everybody's been accounted for who has turned it in. And if you haven't yet, because of any reason at all, please just make sure to do it soon. Uh, I won't be punitive if I receive your essay 
very soon, but if I was to get it like late in the day, then it could be eligible for some type of consideration of a slight deduction of late credit. But I'm, I'm going to be fair and reasonable. So if you give me something and you haven't just yet sent it, as long as it's coming in soon, then it'll be fine. Today. Okay. All right, then, everyone. So um, that was the first order of business to just clarify that I have uh, received those essays and they are due today. So have they not been sent, please do it um, ASAP. Other than that, if you look at our calendar, you'll see that we have two review sessions scheduled this week, today and Wednesday. So I gave you guys the study guide. I mailed it last, I think, Thursday, just before um, we went away for the weekend. And now that you have the study guide, we're going to use that study guide just like we did before for the midterm with the earlier midterm study guide to go over as many of these questions and topics as we can to get you all prepared and ready for the upcoming uh, final. Your final is going to be um, next week on Thursday the 19th. Sorry, I meant to say Wednesday the 19th from 3 to 4.50 p.m. In the, in the afternoon, late afternoon. So anyway, that's nine days away from now. And in between now and then, there's these two review sessions, my office hours, and all the other ways that we can communicate to get any help or assistance. But let's make the best use of today's time. So um, as I said with before when we had midterm review session, I like the students to, for the most part, lead the meeting, meaning that I like it when uh, you guys try to take the initiative to supply the information that are correct answers. But I'll help out as much as I can or as much as I need to whenever I think that we need um, a little more detail or if I have to correct something or if, if I feel like we're getting off track, I can steer us back onto the right track. But overall, this is your time to go over our study guide. So. I hope you have the study guide. Please pull it up right now if you haven't already, because today and Wednesday there are no lectures. There's just review. So um, pull that study guide up, and as soon as you're ready, go ahead and start talking about the questions that you want us to discuss. And whenever you call a question out, me and your classmates will try to um, you know, go through them. Yeah, Kirsten, I was saying uh, <laughs> earlier, yes, that I – I have received your your uh, essay. It's from 11:34 a.m. and yes, I do have it. So thank you. I would I have to finish confirming all the received essays after this class because I've just been slammed all morning with grading, with teaching, and with other tasks. But my plan is to directly reply to you right after 3:45, and I do have it. I see it in my inbox. I just looked at it. So I have it. Okay, review session. Please go into the study guide and uh, go through the questions that you see and let me know what you want to talk about and we'll go over them. We'll try to give answers in whatever order that you like. Notice that the first 43 questions are from the first half of the semester and then 44 up until 81, that's all new stuff from after the midterm. So that's the dividing line. I'm going to ask some questions from before the midterm, but most of them will come from the second half. Anyway, go ahead. Whenever you're ready, those questions, and then we'll all work together on the answers. So you got to go go to study guide. You got to like say, hey, this number. Let's talk about it, or ask the question here in the live chat. So I'm just waiting for you to do that, and then we'll go from there. <clears throat> Everybody has the study guide. It's been sent to you through Titanium. Um, okay, so Diego, you're saying 59, and then Alicia 50. So let's go with those first, and then we'll move to the next from there whenever we have to. Okay, the grandfather paradox. Um, so from David Lewis's article, The Paradoxes of Time Travel, do you guys remember the scenario that we talked about where there was a guy named Tim who was thinking of going back in time to kill his own grandfather when his grandfather was still young? And um, the question was asked, um, you know, think about it logically. Is it possible for Tim to succeed here? This is the so-called uh, question that's revolving around this grandfather paradox. Tell me what you think about that. Can Tim succeed, or why or why not do you think a person might think he could or couldn't succeed? So if a person goes into the past to, like, kill their own grandfather in a way that would prevent their birth, you know, um, tell me what you think is the paradox here. So just kind of walk me through that scenario. Tim goes to the past. He's bent on killing his own grandfather back in 1921. Um... Can anybody tell me why you think that might be, according to some views, not possible to accomplish his, you know, the assassination? Why do you think somebody might claim he couldn't do it? 
Okay, yeah, because if he did it, then he would not exist either. And of course, the only way he could even achieve the act of killing anybody is if he was born. Because <laughs> if a person was never born, they can't do anything, much less kill somebody. So obviously he had to be born to appear in the past from the future using the time machine. Therefore, we appear to conclude that he can't possibly achieve this goal because it would uh, contradict the fact that he was born. On the other hand, though, um, no, Diego, that's not the answer that time travel is not possible. The whole thesis of David Lewis is that it is possible, and he's trying to set this so-called paradox to the side, so no. Um, the paradox is that on the one hand, it seems impossible for the reasons that we just described. Impossible for him to succeed in his attempt, not impossible for him to go to the past. Um, Another way of looking at it, though, David Lewis says, is that it seems to some that he might be able to succeed just on the basic fact that he's back there in the past and that he has the means and the motive to do it. Like, what's to stop him? Okay, so how does Lewis resolve the apparent paradox? He says that in a way, there's kind of an ambiguity with regard to the word can't. And again, the paradox is like that it seems sort of like he can't do it, but also that maybe he could do it. And he thinks that the ambiguity in the word can explains away the paradox, because when we talk about what we can do, Sometimes we speak about it in a narrow sense, and sometimes we speak about it in a broad sense. What one can do in the narrow sense is what they can do given a narrow range of factors. What a person can do in the broad sense is what they can do given a bigger picture range of factors. So like he gave the example about speaking Russian. Um, if I ask you, can you speak Russian, your intuitive answer would probably be like, no, because you haven't learned it yet. But if I change the question a little and said, compared to like a cat, could you speak Russian? Now you're thinking, okay, well, yes, because I have the ability anyway to learn it if I really, really focused on it, which a cat can't do. And so looking at the question again, can Tim kill his grandfather? Um, can Tim kill his grandfather? He says, well, in the narrow sense, it looks like he can just because he's there when you just zero in on the fact that he's there with a the gun. But in the big picture, broad sense of can, no, because we already have explained that he's been born and so no action could possibly occur that would eliminate that from having happened. So this explains away the paradox, according to Lewis. Anyway, long story short, if one wants to go back into the past to, you know, change something, could they actually do it? Like in the case of Tim trying to cause his grandfather to die at a time before he ever gave birth or, sorry, conceived one of Tim's parents. It seems like he can't because it would contradict facts of history, but it seems like he can just because he's there and in the end, Lewis says, we can sort of have it both ways because the word can is ambiguous. Um, but Lewis's dominant intuition is that literally he can't succeed if it means killing his grandfather because that would prevent his own birth. Okay, grandfather paradox. That's the time travel scenario from Lewis that was described in his paper, Paradoxes of Time Travel. Okay, so Alicia, now 50 is your question. 50 says, why are beliefs from sense perception not certain? And why are beliefs about math not even certain, according to Descartes? Okay, that's a good one. So then let me know, why is it that Mr. Descartes said, you cannot really be sure. Uh, yeah, sorry, David, let me pause for a minute for your question. Yes, the final is like the midterm. Uh, I may ask you instead of seven, like eight questions, just because you have a little additional time. You had 75 minutes for the midterm, and you're going to have um, 110 minutes for, uh, for this. So that's another 35 minutes additional. Uh, that means I might ask you to answer eight instead of seven. But pretty much similar, yes. Uh, there will be a question bank, I will select questions, and then I will say answer eight out of this set of, I don't know, 11 or 12. Okay, so, but yes, to number 50, which was about uh, Descartes. Descartes uses a method of doubt to try and figure out what's certain. And using this method of doubt, he says, there's a lot of things that you can doubt and that are no longer so certain, including everything that you perceive with your senses, even math. Tell me if you could, why does he say that the five senses cannot absolutely be trusted, why it's possible for them to be wrong? So yeah, that's what it says. It says, why are beliefs from sense perception not certain? So right now, I mean, it looks like you're looking at something and you're hearing something, my voice. How come that's not certain? Good, Catherine, because you could be dreaming, okay? So if you were dreaming, you've had dreams, right? When you have dreams, you think that there's something real that's happening, but it's not real. I've had dreams where I'm being, you know, chased down by people at risk of death. All kinds of embarrassing, weird, messed up situations happen to me in dreams, uh, but they're not real, and so that's nice. None of those things are really on my record, you know, because they're not real things. Um, now, this is reality, you think, not a dream. 
but maybe it is. And if it were, then I guess the things that you're perceiving now might not be real either. So dreaming provides the possibility for doubting all your five senses. Everything you see, taste, touch, hear, and smell. What about the other thing, though, about math and logic? He goes in a slightly different direction with that. How could it be that when I'm adding up, I don't know, 5 plus 5 and I get 10, how could that be wrong? This isn't so much about dreaming, but about what's the other cause that this could be incorrect. And yeah, we'll get to that, Jasmine, no worries. But on the point of uh, how you could doubt math, what did Descartes say on that? Anybody have some remember memories on this? How could I doubt math? How could I doubt that there's three sides on a triangle? How could I doubt that, you know, the points along the perimeter of a circle are all equidistant from the radius? Like mathematical and logical truisms. How could these be doubted? He says if God wanted to, then he could. Yes, he does say that, Kirsten, but actually, to be fair, he says, well, even if he could, though, he wouldn't because he's too good for that. Um, wait, so sorry, Kristen, let me get your comment. It says, says if God wanted to, then he could convince you that mathematical principles are incorrect. Oh, well, oh, okay. Your follow-up comment is that because he's omnibenevolent, he wouldn't choose to do it. Right. So it could be an evil demon. That's right. The evil demon is the possibility that gives rise to the other doubt about math and stuff. So, okay, guys. Uh, you play a lot of video games, right? So you know that when there's video games, someone programs the game, and then there's characters in the game that, like, they're playable. What if you're a playable character? Okay, going way down the rabbit hole. But what if you're a playable character in, like, a video game created in another dimension of reality? Then the programmer could be, like, the so-called evil demon that's programming you to think you have total certainty about math, but it's actually totally false. So anyway, you know... Pursued through the example of a so-called evil demon or a substituted example like the one I gave you. It's possible for some external being, not God, he's too good for that, but for some other external being to be inputting you with false mathematical beliefs. So we got those two things. You could be dreaming it all, that's why your senses could be wrong, or also you could have an evil demon manipulating your mind, and that could be even the reason that stuff like math is wrong, uh, possibly. Okay, good. So I'm going back and I see Christian asked about 49. Okay, so why did Descartes even use the method of doubt? What was the, so, you know, I guess to be perfectly explicit, let's say what's the method of doubt one time? Tell me what is the method of doubt? It says to assume something if something, what does it say specifically? So let me get that point clear, and then we can add some further detail. The method of doubt says that we should be doing what? And once you define it, then we'll ask why, why would you do that? <clears throat> so method of doubt definition, let me know. <clears throat> Assume anything to be false that can possibly be doubted. Okay, good. So if it's even possible, if it's in the realm of possibility that it's false, you're going to be like, boom, it's totally false. Okay, at least for the sake of argument until we get something that can't be doubted. Now, why do we, why does he say to do that? Just for fun, just to get some laughs? What if we're dreaming? Ha ha. I mean, it's not just for laughs, really. He wants to do this for a kind of important reason. Why does he say that we should play around with the method of doubt? What would be the point of it all? He's not just doing this for laughs. I mean, it is kind of funny sometimes, but, you know, that's not why he's doing it. He's doing it because he's trying to figure something out. What? Let me know that, because that's really the heart of question 49. So you would say, what is the method of doubt? And then you would say, why did the author um, claim that this is something that we ought to do? Why? Why Why assume everything's false that could be doubted? What would be the point of doing it? Descartes said, and you can tell me. <clears throat> because by doing that, we might be able to what? Now you're going to finish the thought. To discover what is absolutely certain, or as you put it, Summer, to find true knowledge, yes. So with the method of doubt, he thought that, that we would be able to determine what is really certain for sure. And um, why did he want certainty? Can anybody tell me about that? Why did he say we need to figure out what is totally certain? Because the method of doubt is the method he thinks that will lead us to the certainty. But why do we need the certainty? Why do we need to find something totally certain? Do you have memory of that? Like, what's in your mind? Where are your memories? Can you remember these things I've taught you now that we're at the end? I hope so. I hope you remember them for your whole life, not just for the final. But anyway, back to my question. Why would we be looking for certainty? According to Descartes, look at the historical picture, the time that he lived in, and if you can, tell me why he thought that it was important to determine what's certain. <clears throat> why? I mean, I'm being picky, not picky, but I just kind of want to make sure that all the details are clear. 
or at least that I've done my duty to provide those details, whether you remember them or not. So why should we look for certainty? You say to find true knowledge. I guess this is one way to put it. Um, yes. It's like at the time that he's living in, it's the 1600s. If you look at the West and the history of the West, this is like the time when we really start to branch off of just pure religion dominating everything. So now we're getting science, we're getting calculus, we're getting Newton's laws of physics, we're getting biology, we're learning about cells, and on and on and on. And so he thought that since we're growing this body of knowledge really, really fast, and we see it's rapidly growing, we want to make sure it's settled on a foundation that's firm. So he thinks the foundation stones of our human structure of knowledge have to be well-based. And they're only going to be well-based if they're based on ironclad certainty. So let's figure out what's certain first, and then we can build everything else on top of that certainty. So the method of doubt was employed in the quest for certainty, which could give a foundation to the growing structure of human knowledge. There you go. Very good. And so that's all true and correct. All right. So the next question, I guess, uh, that you asked about, let me go up here. Someone asked about number 34, Jasmine, right? Okay, let me go back and see that. 34 from the first half of class. Uh, so two objections to Singer's argument that we have some moral obligation to assist the absolute poor. Okay, so why, um, why do anybody find fault with Peter Singer's argument? Singer argues that we have an obligation to assist the poor. Here was his argument, just to repeat it one time. Um, if you can prevent something bad without making major sacrifices, then you should. And absolute poverty is bad. And by the way, you can prevent some without even giving up much of your own well-being. So therefore, you ought to do that. Now, that's his argument. What were some objections that he mentioned against the argument that his critics might have stated? He gave names to the different objections. Um, so I'm hoping that some of you will remember at least some of the names of those objections, and then we can comment on them. Objections against the idea that you should be helping the global poor. What objections were there in reaction to that? So everything that we talk about and everything from the notes, and from, sorry, from the study guide is, is taken from the book, from the notes, and from the lectures. So it's certainly all there, and I know it's been taught, but it takes a little moment sometimes to remember. So just go ahead and let me know. Now, Anthony, you're speaking of Garrett Hardin and Tragedy of the Commons. Well, yes, Garrett Hardin was totally opposed to Singer's argument, correct. But the objections that we're referring to are actually reported on in Singer's own paper. Hardin's overall objection is much like the triage objection of Singer. So if you wanted to integrate that, you could say Garrett Hardin, you know, with the lifeboat metaphor, is kind of arguing in the way of triage, that if you try to help, you're actually going to just make things worse by making the population of poor people bigger. Meanwhile, the problem of poverty isn't going away, so it's just creating a bigger problem. That's triage. But there's more than just triage, and the question asks about two. So, Tina, taking care of our own, that's another one. Kirsten, property rights, that's yet another one, yes. And leaving it to the government, another one. So um, I'll say a few brief words about each of these because if you chose, like if this question was chosen, you'd want to be able to speak about what two of those different objections are. Okay, so taking care of our own, let's go with this first. Somebody might say, I don't have an obligation to assist the global poor, the international community of poor people starving, because if I have obligations to care for anybody, then it can't be that big. It's got to be a more limited number of people, and who could it be my own? So some people say I'm only obligated to take care of my own. No more than that, no less. And who are my own? Maybe somebody could argue. Like who, who do you think the critic is speaking about when he says I only have to take care of my own, not the global poor? Our own could include such people like who? Let me see you say something about that. Your local poor, yes, and even more immediately, you know, you might include, of course, your friends, family, and people like that. But aside from your family, friends, and fellow citizens, some people might say, it doesn't go beyond that. I don't have obligations to take care of people that are starving in villages and, like, poor parts of the world. Okay, that's one objection. Another objection was property rights. And property rights uh, is all about the idea that I have no obligation to give over my money to the poor because my money is my property. And my property rights allow me to dispose of my wealth however I want or to hoard it or to retain it or to even spend it on things that don't benefit anybody, including myself. Like what if I want to buy a whole bunch of cigarettes and alcohol today and just basically destroy my health with that stuff? I mean, I'm free to do that and because the wealth that I own is my property. So a person might just say simply based on property rights alone, 
I'm under no obligation to do anything with my money that I don't want to do. Even if it's not necessarily helping people, it's still my wealth, and therefore I'm free to oversee it in whatever way I want. Because um, people can say wealth and income is part of your property, and having property rights entitles you to do as you wish with that. Now, another objection is the one that leaving it to the government. Leaving it to the government just basically says, don't put it on individual citizens to help the international poor. Create like a national program that collects from the taxes of all people, and that diverts funding to the international poor. But don't leave it to the individuals because people um, are random. Some people have feelings of charity, others don't. And if it was a government program, then we would all be invested into it. There would be more funding and it would be more reliable. So some people say, it's not that I disagree there should be assistance, but it should be the government's job, not the personal job of individuals. And then triage, okay. Triage is a policy that is done when you have um, like an overload of people that are either sick or dying, and you have a shortage of medical attention that you can give to them. So it's like, it's kind of like, like India right now as an example, um, something that could have happened here if, if coronavirus got way too far out of control where hospitals are just totally overwhelmed. But imagine, right, it's not even imaginary. I mean, just look in the news and you'll see that in some cases, like for example, what's happening now in India, you have too many people that are sick, not enough hospitals, doctors, and medical facilities. So what do you do in that case? Well, you have to employ what's called triage, which is a tough policy, but it's done to try and maximize the ability to save lives with scarce medical resources. So you basically have to divide the population of sick or injured persons into three categories. One category are the people who are so far gone with their sickness or injury that they're going to die almost no matter what you do, they're like a lost cause group. On the opposite extreme, you have people who are sick, but they're really not in the worst case. They're actually doing pretty well. And so even though they could use some help, it's not urgent and they're not likely to die even if they don't get help. Then you have a middle ground category, which is all important because that's the group where some people, where, where sorry, where people will probably survive if they receive help, but they'll probably die if they don't. And so by isolating that middle ground category, this is where you're going to pour most of your precious medical resources, because if you divert these scarce resources to the people that are already the worst off, you're wasting resources on people that are already too far gone. And if you're using the same attention on people that don't need it, then, of course, that's also a waste because there are other people who could really use that help to survive. Um, and as an objection to Singer's argument, a person might make the case that when you try to help the whole international community of poor people, it's like trying to send resources to the worst of the worst affected by poverty. And that, according to triage, is not going to work out because you're simply going to be working on the lost cause group. And in terms of international aid, this will simply cause that group to become more numerous in terms of numbers until such time as it becomes an unsustainably large cohort of people. Now you have to withdraw assistance and you have an even bigger problem. So triage is another objection. Okay, so that was a question about number 34, which asks, explain two objections to Singer's argument. And there's four that are there, but you would, if I was chosen, refer to two. Okay, so then, um, I saw your question, Jasmine, and uh, I guess now we're just waiting for more. Okay, so Alicia, you say 56 and seven. Scrolling down to that. Okay, so closed loop of causation involving time travel. <clears throat> Going back over to the, oh, no problem. Thanks to Jasmine. So to David Lewis's article again, do you guys remember the example he gave of like um, a person receives a phone call from someone in the future who, uh, well, they don't know who it is at first, but they just receive a phone call and the person says, hey, yo, make a, make a machine. Don't ask questions. I have blueprint for making a machine. Follow these instructions down to the last detail and make it. Okay, so they call you you make this machine based on the instructions you received on the phone. Now you leave it sitting in your garage for like 10 years. 10 years later, you're a little older. You blow the dust off this thing that you built based off the phone call. And you notice that it's what? A time machine. So you get in the machine and you take it 10 years back. Do you remember this little uh, link in, this, in the narr narrative? How does this story continue? So a guy gets a call. Person tells him, make machine. 10 years pass, he turns machine on, it's time machine. He goes back 10 years. Now that he's back in the past, what's he gonna do? What's he gonna do in this case? Do you remember the scenario? Let me know. Even if you don't remember it and you think you're hearing it for the first time right now, 
Tell me what you guess is the next step in this science fiction plot, okay? Guy gets call, builds machine based on call. 10 years later, uses it to go back 10 years so that he can arrive into his relative past and call his younger self to tell them how to make the machine. Correct. So look at that, that's a loop. Because where'd this information come from about how to build the machine? It's sort of inscrutable. The information originally comes from the received phone call. But the caller on the other end, how do they know how to make it? Well, because they have memories of the past when they were younger, when they received a phone call telling them how to make a machine. And then now they're just passing that information along testimonially to someone on the other end of a phone line. Uh, so the individual links in the story kind of make coherent sense, but the big picture of it is just bizarre. Like where did this information ever come from in the first place? So that's another one of the so-called paradoxes, these loops of causation that Lewis says, some people argue make time travel like impossible. But he doesn't think it's impossible. He just thinks the loops are weird, but that they're not like logically contradictory. You know, I was thinking about this whole loop scenario on my own, um, and I kind of created another one. It's a little weird, though. You guys want to hear it? Okay. So you're like, no. But anyway, um, here's another possibility. Okay, story time. Once upon a time, well, maybe it could be any time. So what happened was this kid w uh, grows up with a single mother. Okay, single mother, um, and you know, she's got some burns and stuff that she suffered um, during her pregnancy, but you know, she had a successful you know, pregnancy anyway. Anyway, that kind of disfigured her a little bit. And she doesn't like showing the, the son photos of her from before the accident, because it's painful memories of her old appearance. So anyway, it doesn't bother him. I mean, that's his mom, he loves her. And she's been a very caring parent, a single parent, though. And he never really got to know the father. He asks his mom about, who's my father? And she's like, you know, he's a mysterious guy. You know, um, I had a, like a brief romance with him. And then that's how we conceived you. And I never saw him again. Um, but he looks a lot like you, you know. Anyway, so he always wondered throughout his life, this kid growing up, who's my dad? I would love to know. But he never could find out. So one day when he gets older, what does he do? He builds a time machine. And he uses this time machine to go back to his mother's prime when uh, when she supposedly met this father, right? Because he wants to be able to see in the past who that guy was. So it goes back, goes back. He goes back to the past. And um, he's looking all over for where his mom is, you know, but he can't seem to find her. Part of the problem is that he can't e easily recognize her because of the difference between her past appearance that he was never allowed to see and then the burns that she suffered later. So he kind of gets mixed up while he's in the past and he ends up falling in love with somebody. And like they, you know, hook up and she gets pregnant. And what he realizes is, wait a minute, like this is his actual mom. So like, the big reveal is, what the hell, what have I done? You know, I've just conceived myself. And so the sort of uh, plot twist, I guess, is that it was him all along. He was the father. And then he, you know, he freaks out and goes back into the future. So that's another loop, right? This is a loop where the person is their own progenitor. Um, another closed causal loop. So where did he come from? He came from the mother's you know, womb. And when did that happen? Because she conceived a child with a man uh, um, that you know came into her life and left that looked a lot like the son, ha ha. Um, but anyway, it's another loop situation. So there's loop situations like that in science fiction narratives. And one such example is the phone call um, and this other one that I just kind of freestyled, which I was tell talking to people on Facebook about just for fun, getting a lot of funny comments and reactions back. But anyway, yeah, loops. Closed causal loops, where the whole loop and the whole sequence of events is internally consistent, but um, it doesn't make sense how it happened because it seems like facts about the sequence of events are caught in the loop itself. If time travel were possible, you'd expect such things to be able to happen. But maybe that's really the fact about the universe. I mean, maybe you know, the universe created itself and it's a big loop. Okay, so going back, uh, more questions that you have. So that was 50, sorry, uh, six. Now let me see what was 57. Yeah, so if a person talks to their past self on the phone, how many people are having the conversation according to David Lewis? Another possible paradox of time travel is like, how many is that? Is that two people or one? And um, what is his ultimate answer to that, if you can remember? So say that like, I don't know, you go back to 2016 right now and you're gonna go tell yourself in 2016, hey, just heads up, there's about to be President Trump and all this other stuff's gonna happen. So you, you make the phone call, you're, you're this, CSU Fullerton version of you talking to your high school age younger self. How many people are on the phone call if that really happened? It's not going to happen, sure, whatever, but play along. If it did happen, how many people would be on the call? 
one person, yeah, David, but what are the two things? Because there's obviously a call, there's a sender and a receiver of the call. What are the two things if not this, uh, if not two people? You're right that it's one person, but the two things we would say are two different what of the one person. Can you complete that thought? One person, but two, what's the word? Yes, two temporal parts of the same person, correct. So one later temporal part of the person's time sequence is placing the call. An earlier temporal part in the same time sequence, earlier in the individual stages of life, is receiving that same call. Why would we say it's the same person but two temporal parts instead of saying it's two wholly different people? Well, because if it was really two different people, it would be like me and you, where I don't have a memory of being you, okay? Um, but if I was talking to my younger self, I would remember not only receiving the call, but I would remember all the events in the individual's life that led up to receiving it. So when you're talking to different people, it's not like you have memories of their past. But if you went to the past to talk to your younger self, then you would have memories of being that person. So there's a psychological continuity uh, between the temporal parts that does not exist when there's two bona fide different consciousnesses or two different people. Okay, so he resolves that paradox away. He says, some would say it's two, some would say it's one. Is that a paradox? And he's like, no, not really. It's just one person, but two temporal parts. Problem solved, and they're connected by memory. So that's why they're not two people. Okay, so that was 57. Let us hear about what else you have. As the questions keep coming, we'll keep going through answers as much as we can so you can get your notes ready. But let me know what's next. <clears throat> It's always good to go back to the text when you hear like a summary of something and then you're like my memory of the book itself is a little bit fuzzy it's good to like connect the work of the book with your in-class discussions because I think it just makes it stick in your mind longer you learned about knowledge and you learned about how when you have the justification you retain facts and information when you're just trying to like memorize stuff and you don't know what it's based on you won't remember it so it's just a fact that you need to kind of read stuff sometimes to create hooks that your like content will hook onto. But anyway, um, we'll be reviewing Wednesday as well. Oh yes, we will. The two sessions for this. Um, this is just part one. But anyway, David for 54. <clears throat> 56 in class, let me see Tina. Soon you'll be in the past. No, we talk, uh, wait, sorry, 56. Oh, the closed loop of causation. It's possible we didn't talk about it. I know it's in the article uh, and that we did discuss Lewis's work. I'll go back and review the tape. Um, but anyway, we've discussed it now, so it's on the study guide and it's in the essay. You are responsible for it. Um, continuing from here, number 54. Explain why according to the space-time theory, nothing really changes. Okay, good. So some people think that it's not plausible to embrace the space-time theory because one of its consequences is that there's no such thing really as change. Uh, what wouldn't be called change gets re-described in a different way. So for example, if a person, let's say, gets like a haircut, or I don't know, like I have like kind of some facial hair. Suppose I shave it off and then I'm clean shaven and I show up to the Wednesday meeting and you'd be like, oh yeah, you have a different look. Um, on the space-time theory though, where all the points of space-time all exist, all the moments, including the whole past, the whole future and the present, they're all just out there and they're all equally real. Um, we wouldn't really say that there was change because the temporal part of me that has this facial hair has always been at that point on the timeline. And the subsequent temporal part that's after the shave, where there's a clean shave in appearance, that temporal part's also always been on its position in the timeline. But if you look at the overall sequence of events in total, nothing has shifted position or changed. They've all just been occupying their relative positions in space time. So that means there's no actual change. But to David Lewis or to Ted Sider anyway, it's not really so much of a problem to say that we give up on the notion of change in space-time theory because we simply redefine it. Now what used to be called something changing gets redescribed as one object having two temporal parts with different features. Okay, so like if I show up on Wednesday with a clean shaven face, that means that one temporal part of me dated Wednesday the 20, sorry, the 12th um, has that quality. And another temporal part of me dated at this time has this different appearance. 
but the qualitative difference between the two temporal parts has always existed and always will. So there's not so much one and the same thing undergoing change as two parts of the same object having different features. Okay, so that's the way that the author tries to um, explain how on space-time theory nothing quite changes. And that was discussed by Ted Sider actually in the article Time, right after he finishes talking about temporal parts and space-time diagrams. Okay, so David, you say, does the space-time theory just say that the future past now are all set in stone? Like that's what's confusing me in, with this question. Um, but you seem to know the answer. Yes, they are all set in stone. I mean, set in stone almost, though, makes it sound like what will happen is foretold. But it's not that it will in the sense of it's waiting to happen. All these events are already real, so they all exist right now. The past of you exists, and the future of you also exists, just like this present moment exists. Can you imagine thinking that the future is just as real as the present? That's what the space-time theory is asking you to believe or to accept. And so if you do accept that, then there's no room for anything to change because everything that ever has and ever will happen is already there. So how can things change if all the future moments are already there? You understand? So that's the implication, right? Um, so you say that's what's confusing me with the question, um, with the question of change. Yeah, change is eliminated and replaced by saying that two temporal parts of an object can have different features. So like a temporal part of you from being five years old was very small. And a temporal part of you, if we could take a freeze frame today, is a little bigger than that. But that doesn't mean that you have changed. It just means that one temporal part in the sequence has a different shape and size than a later temporal part in the same sequence. But the whole sequence overall, all of it always exists. And it's not like it's unfolding in time. Does this make sense, David? Am I getting to your comment? Hopefully I am. But you'll let me know. Okay, so then going ahead with number, uh, first I see Jasmine just in terms of, the list, your first, so 79, and then, Christian, we can try to get to those others. Okay, um, <clears throat> 79, what is existentialism? Okay, now existentialism was briefly discussed right at the tail end of the last meeting, so there's not a lot to say, but what can you say? Existentialism holds one major claim. There's like a very core principle that really lies at the heart of existentialist thought. And it's the statement that says something precedes something else. Can you tell me what that statement was? This comes before that. So I know that, that we did talk about at least that much from the Jean-Paul Sartre existentialism article. Existentialists claim that, yes, Tina, correct, that existence precedes essence. Okay. What is the essence of a thing? What is the essence of something? What's the definition of the word essence? Correct. Existence precedes essence, right? Now we're going to unpack that a little bit by asking a follow-up question, what is essence in, in the sense of existentialism using this word? The essence of something is kind of a fancy, weird way of saying what about something. The what about a thing is its essence. The, you say the attributes of something. Yes, Alicia. But what kind of attributes? The core attributes, like the defining essential attributes of it. So I think I said to you that if I was asking you for the essence of a square, you would have to tell me four sides, equal length sides, interior angles, 90 degree angles. And that would be like essential to the concept of it. But saying blue would not be part of its essence because a square doesn't need to be blue, but it does need, need to have four sides. Okay, so needed qualities that are defining of something are the essence of it. Now to a person like me or you, existentialists think that we have essences and you know your essence is just in other words the very fundamental things that you would say about yourself if you're trying to give people a sense of what you're all about like you would say what your religion or lack thereof was what your um, values or beliefs are whether you're more or less liberal or conservative maybe you would talk about <clears throat> sorry you might talk about what subjects that you study in school or that you're majoring in um, what's your um, I don't know like gender and orientation and the way that you express those things. So your taste in film, music, art, fashion, literature. Okay, so the things about you that make you the person that you are. We're all a little bit different, but the, those kind of cluster of attributes, that would be your essence. In my case, I would be like, okay, philosopher, musician, runner, um, I don't know, politically, maybe tilted towards the left a little bit. Um, 
you know, I would say certain things about myself, my, my uh, values, beliefs, etc. Okay, so back to the question, what is existentialism? It says existence precedes essence. So here's another question, what is preceding? If something precedes something, what does that mean? Preceding, just let me know this one. Because to precede essence, we have to be able to say what that exactly means. To come before, exactly. So right, that's correct, Alicia. So existence precedes essence. Now we're in position to say, having defined essence and defined precede. It means that when it's a human being, we start by existing, and we don't have an essence yet. So before we have an essence, we just exist. And then the essence takes shape over time. So like whether you are conservative, liberal, religious, atheist, um, a fan of rap music, rock music, um, you know, whatever kind of cultural or fashion choices, whatever it is that makes you you, that stuff comes into shape later. And according to existential thought, where did the essence that you have come from? It comes from your own free choices. So they don't think that it comes from like your environment or from your genetics or from your parenting. It just comes from you, from your own free decisions. And they really, really hammer that home. That's like the core idea. Existence precedes essence and you are totally in control of your essence. Nothing else is. In fact, they say that when you try to blame something other than yourself for your essence, like, hey, it's my parents, tell them why I'm like this. That's called bad faith. Bad faith is when you try to avoid responsibility for your own essence and put it on something outside of yourself that you can't control. So anyway, long story short, existentialists say that existence precedes essence, which means that you control and create your own um, identity and who you are. And when you do that, that reflects your sense of how people ought to live and what your own values are. So like if you choose to be a Christian, then you, you believe in Christianity, not just for yourself, but for everybody. Or if you choose atheism, right, then that means that you've decided that that's the right way to live. And if other people are atheists, you approve of those choices. It's kind of like me. I'm a philosopher. And when students come to me and they say, hey, I'm getting interested in philosophy, thinking of taking it as a major or a minor, I'm always very approving of that because how could I not be? I mean, that's what I did, and I thought it was good for me, so I think it's good in general. So existence precedes essence. You create your own essence. Nothing else does, but you got to own it. If you don't take responsibility for it, that's bad faith. And... Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. He says, when you create your essence, it reflects your own view of the best life, because why would you have acted this way if you thought there was a better way of living or acting? So to the question, what makes one's life go well, he says, just look at your own choices, because that reveals your own sense of how people in general should live. Okay, yeah, so just a couple things I can say about that, and uh, if you read his work, you'll, you'll see it pretty clearly in his own words, too. Okay, so thanks, Jasmine. Now, 63 and 4, and then Alicia, you say 60. So I'm looking at 63. Um, how, how did Descartes come to the conclusion that there really is an external world? Um, so after his long argument that tries to prove dualism is true, based on you know God existing and he's perfectly good, so that means that when you have clear and distinct perceptions, they're really true. He said that one clear and distinct perception is that if two things could be imagined to exist separately then they really are separate and that's how he thinks dualism is proven because you can imagine for example your mind existing with no body attached um, but then there's other clear and distinct perceptions and another one after that was that the external world really exists yeah that the external world really does exist and that's what question 63 is about so um, does anybody remember any of the reasons that uh, Descartes said that it actually is pretty clear that the external world exists. I believe that there's like a total of three possible reasons, but let me know um, what you can remember or what you have from the notes. So the question then is that, uh, why would it appear so obvious and clear that there's really an external world despite the method of doubt that he was playing around with earlier? Who can say? Why well, think there's an external world? It has some stuff to do with like what you cannot just cause yourself to perceive through an act of the mind or through will. But, um, but I still kind of would prefer it if you could say a few things first, and then I'll just meet you halfway. <clears throat> In the notes, it was like other clear and distinct perceptions. And then, okay, there you go, Christian, good. One of the points is that you cannot only perceive the things that are favorable to you. 
If the world was a dream or something that was mind created and not actually objectively real, then wouldn't you assume that you could somehow like shape the world to your desires and to your will? So like if I said, okay, I'm just going to manifest this right now. I'm just going to make some wealthy guy call me today and be like, do you need a million dollars? Because I'm happy to hand it over to you since I'm giving it to professors that work at different colleges randomly. If I want that to happen and I think hard about it, it's still not going to happen. And that shows you that this world is not something I'm just creating with my mind. Like I could just edit it to my interests. So that's the point you make, Kirsten. I cannot perceive only the things that are favorable. And if this world was a dream or an illusion and I'm the dreamer, then you think I could somehow like lucid dream things into happening that I just want, but that's not how it works. And the second point you make also is correct, Kirsten, that you cannot control what you perceive. So um, if the world was something that was not independently of existing outside of your mind, then you would think that your mind could just pop, make stuff pop out of nowhere. Like right now on this table, I want you to just see, I don't know, like a, a, a bunny rabbit. I mean, you can imagine one in your mind's eye, but I guarantee you, unless something weird is happening, that you're not seeing one as though it's right here positioned in front of this table in space. And so that's another reason to think that the objects out there, they're not just made up because if they were, you could cause some of them to go away or have other ones come in. And that's just not at, at all what happens. And then another thing, yes, memories are not as clear and vivid as a current perception is. So like right now, this is the current moment. Like what we're doing right now, this is the present. If you think back to our earlier meetings, that's all in the past. So if I ask you to compare these two states of consciousness, having this present experience, and then on the other hand, going back into your memory of like, I don't know, one of our meetings during the first two weeks, I bet you that you think this is a little bit more vivid and sharp than the like mental playback of what we did back then. Well, what makes the difference between the memory state and the present perception? Why is this sharper? And that's like faded and less clear. It can only be because when you first have the perception, you're in the presence of the object that generates the perception. Like right now you're sitting in front of the computer and that object outside of you is giving you this very clear image. When you think back to an earlier lecture and you're just using the memory you have, it's not as clear because you're no longer surrounded by the object that gave the original perception. You're kind of trying to revive the image of it in your mind's eye. Now, if the world was just a big mental state, and there was no real actual external world, then when you think back to memories, they would be just the same as present perceptions because in neither case would there really be anything outside of you that you were in contact with. So only on the hypothesis that there's an external world can we explain the mismatch between the two levels of clarity. Clarity when you have an original experience because the object is right there, less clear later when you try to recall that because now having passed time, you're no longer in the presence of the original external thing that you perceived. Okay, so those are reasons that he gave why it seems clear and distinct that there really is an external world. Um, and so next I saw the question of 64, and that's kind of along the same lines, so we can continue on that theme. Why does he say that it seems pretty clear that you have a body? So one thing is that there's an external world, okay. Why does he say that it seems pretty obvious and clear that you have a physical body and that you're not just, I don't know, a mind floating around with no body. What makes it clear that that body is yours? He gave three different reasons for this one too. So let me see if you can tell me that. What reason does any of us have to come to the obvious conclusion that you have a body? And no, you can't just say what, look at it, what is there? No. What's the deeper reason that he says that, you know, the philosopher can identify? It? seems pretty clear that you have a body for one because why because you can control your body with your mind right but you can't control other bodies with your own mind so if I say right now I'm gonna hold a fist with my left hand and I'm doing it it's just because my mind sends the message to the hand to do it but I can't like look at someone else and be like over there he's gonna ball up his fist watch this and then he just does it like what's happening so I only have control physically over one body my own uh, in terms of like mental control. I mean, I could order someone or I could hold a gun and then be like, you're going to put your fist together and then they would probably do it. But it's not the same as just having direct control over your own physical specimen. So that's one reason to think it's your body because you can control it, but not the other ones. Another thing is this, and that's Tina, what you're also reporting, that when your own body is stimulated with some stimuli, you experience a sensation. But if other people's bodies are given a stimuli, you can observe them having the reaction, but you don't have the same one yourself. So like 
if um, if you watch a fight, like you're watching boxing and someone gets punched, like the Canelo fight over the weekend, um, you might be like, ooh, that hurt, but you don't feel like it actually punched you, okay? Now, if you're the one receiving the punch, though, it would be a direct experience of the stimulus to your own body. So wouldn't that make it seem obvious that this is your body? Because when something happens to it, you feel it. But when something happens to other bodies, you don't feel it. And then a third thing is that you also cannot seem to remove yourself physically from the body that you're in, but any other person's body, you can go as far away from it as you like. So um, there's a unique aspect of the one body that you're situated within, and that's because you can control it, you feel things that happen to it, and you can't seem to get away from it. Except, of course, if you died, and then God, he says, would separate your soul and mind from the body. But short of that, you're locked in. Okay, so that's everything about 64. And to continue from there, uh, I see Alicia's asked about 60. So let me go, go ahead and look at what that one was. Um, okay, monism and dualism. <clears throat> Two different views about how many substances make everything in the universe and in reality. So do tell me, um, what's the definition of monism? And then what's the definition of dualism? And then we can add more detail from there. But that's the first point. What does monism say? And then what different thing does dualism say about the same topic? Okay, yeah, we'll try to get to 55 when we can. But on monism and dualism, someone will just list the definitions out, and then we can go from there. <clears throat> so it just takes a moment, maybe... Maybe your memory has it, maybe your notes, or the book, or some combination of those. But the information exists, you just got to retrieve it. So just tell me, what's the definition of either monism or dualism? Okay, so Christian, monism. It says, everything in the universe is made out of only one kind of substance. Correct. And Tina, uh, same. Monism is where everything in the universe is made out of one kind of substance. Okay, very well. What's dualism then? Okay, back to you, Christian. It means that everything in the universe is made out of two different kinds of substances. Yes, that's also right. But now we have to add a little bit more detail. Hi, Ishmael. Good to see you. Not to worry. Um, so here's the follow-up. So what are the different substances that are being mentioned by either theory? Uh, talk to me about what is the substance that is labeled physical matter. What's physical matter? Because when you talk about monism says everything's made out of one substance, dualism says everything's made out of two, then you would, you would further back that up by saying, and the substance that could be the one and only substance is either this or that. And then you would be able to speak about what the different branches of monism are. But, um, but anyway, so physical matter is anything that is extended in space, such as atoms. That's right. So if it takes up space, if it has any volume or mass, even if it's extremely small, then that's a piece of physical matter. Okay. And the other type of substance they call mind. And what is mind all about? It's not made out of matter, at least not in the way it's described philosophically by dualists. So mind is what? <clears throat> Tell me about mind. Kind of like a soul, you know, but the terminology often used is mind. So in, in the philosopher's definition of mind, it is, is what? What's that substance? So Tina, you helped us with matter. And now mind. Something that is not extended in space. Well, you say such as thinking. That's not correct. It should be and is thinking. Okay, so um, the mind is not extended in space and it is thinking. Correct. So it's like the idea of like a soul or a ghost, if you will. Something that you can't weigh, that you can't measure, that you can't even see because it's literally not any size. It's, it's got no spatial dimensions at all. It doesn't have height, length, width, weight. It's just nothing physically, but it's still thinking. So it's like this disembodied, totally non-physical consciousness. Now, dualists say that those two substances both make everything. So most things are made out of matter, even your own body and all the objects that take up space and that have mass. But on dualism, there's more to you than just the body because you also have a mind, which would be the thinking component that does not have any size, shape, or volume. And according to dualism, and most people that believe in it believe in like the afterlife or some version of religion, then you could continue to exist with no body 
like when your body turns to dust because it's going to eventually. On the other hand, though, people that are monists will say that there's only one substance that's making everything. And depending on which one they think there is, they're going to be either physicalists or idealists. Physicalists say that everything in the whole universe is just made out of matter. Even the, even the mind is just made out of matter. So there's really no such thing as a soul or a spirit if you're a physicalist. What there is is a brain, which is a physical object that's very complex. But at the end of the day, that's the thing that causes consciousness. And without a brain, there's no such thing as consciousness. On the other hand, there's also idealism, a kind of neglected, less popular type of monism. But it does say that everything's made out of thoughts. So in that view, there's no such thing as matter. And everything we're looking at is just ideas all around. Um, so we really focused on the differences between physicalist monism and dualism overall. But if you want to have a full-on discussion of the topic of monism and dualism, you'd, re you'd refer to those pieces of information. So monism, the thought that everything in the universe is made of one substance, and it's either matter or mind, depending on which one. And you would define the substances. You would say it's either physicalism or idealism, and dualism embraces both and says that both of those substances jointly make everything up. It's not all mind. It's not all matter, but there's some of both. Okay, so anyway, the people debate on either side, as we learned. Some people disagree with dualism. Some people disagree with physicalism. Okay, so now I see we've uh, gone through that. And uh, Tina, you asked about 55 most recently, so let me see about 55. Soon he'll be in the past. Okay. So Lewis says that a possible paradox of time travel is how um, <clears throat> you could have statements like this, like a person saying, hey, in like 10 minutes, I'm going to be in 1971, which sounds like a contradiction because it sounds like 10 minutes into the future, I'll be 50 years into the past. So what, is time going forwards and backwards? Seems confusing. Um, well, Lewis says there's actually a clear enough way to make sense of a statement like that, soon he will be in the past. Um, what we have to then just do is distinguish between two types of time or two different measurements of time. Now, who can tell me what those two different time frames were that were referred to by David Lewis? He says, we can distinguish between blank time and this other sort of blank time. And you just need to tell me about the word that's supposed to fill the blanks. And then we could go on from there. So. Personal and external time, that's right, Tina. So tell me the definition of personal time or external time or both. And these definitions will help to explain how to make sense of a confusing sentence like, soon I will be in the past. So yeah, personal time, what's the definition there? And then that'll help with the answer. <clears throat> Yeah, because the core of this answer is basically like point out that there's two different types of time, personal and external. Then you would just have to give the definition of the two and Im apply it to an example. So personal time is time as it is experienced, measured by the individual time traveler. Yes, as would be shown on their personal wristwatch, which travels with them physically. External time, okay, that would be time as it is experienced and measured not by the time traveler themselves, but rather by what other uh, external source. So external time, time as it is experienced and measured by all external observers and clocks, right. So when a person says something like, hey, in, in 10 minutes, I will be 50 years minus, we can uh, make coherent sense of that by saying that in 10 minutes of the person's personal time, there'll be 50 years minus in external time. So like their own experience of getting into the machine is like eh, 10 minutes are passing. They get out of the machine and in their mind or in their experience, 10 minutes have passed. But externally, they've now bounced back 50 years into the past. So external time has gone backwards. Their personal time has gone forwards. Or if they were jumping into the future, suppose that you want to see if we're still dealing with a pandemic in 2030. So you hop into the whatever Elon Musk time machine that drops this summer and you zoom up to 2030 and you just tell your friends, yo, this is wild because like in 15 minutes I'm going to be in 2030. It sounds again like a total confusing paradox. How could it be that in 10 minutes you're going to be nine years ahead? Well, now we make sense of it by saying that in 10 minutes of my own experience, lived time, personal time, 
I will be nine years into the future in external time. So like nine years ahead relative to everybody else, but 10 minutes of my own time was spent getting there. Okay, and personal and external time, as weird and science fictional as it sounds, it's actually literally true that there are the difference between the two according to the theory of relativity. The only reason that we don't happen to notice it for the most part is because we're all bounded on the surface of the Earth and not able to move at much different velocities. So time dilation effects are minimal at best, and therefore personal and external time generally coincide for all of us. Okay, so does this apply to time differences? Well, try no, nothing to do with that. So nothing to do with time zones. Time zones are just conventional ways that we can all assign um, coordinates to a clock um, and make them the same coordinates that match the level of light that that part of the Earth has given its orbit around the sun and the way that it tilts on its axis. So to another part of the Earth's sphere, which is not bathed in sunlight, while the other half of it is shown to the sun, the, to the sun that is you know, shining light on it, we don't want to call that the same time of day. So time zones allow us to account for the fact that as the Earth tilts, different parts of it are going to be bathed in sunlight. And therefore, for that part of the Earth's surface, we want to assign it the time of the clock that matches to that type of light condition. So like 12 noon should be like noon daytime. Um, therefore, like if one part of the Earth's surface is farther away from being exposed to the light than the one part that's shining on it now, we're going to call that a different time zone. But there's nothing to do with time travel. It's a common misunderstanding when I teach this stuff about time travel that people are like, oh, it's kind of like time zones, right? Because like right now, if I, if I talk to someone in New York, they think it's 9 a.m. and I think it's 12 p.m. Whoa, that's mind blowing, but it's not that at all. That has nothing to do with relativity of time or anything because clocks themselves are just conventional measurement devices for the passage of events, so no. But it's okay. Um, to the next question though, um, what do you have? We've done 55, there's still about 10 or 12 minutes. So we have time to get in maybe one or two more if you want, but you'll just direct me to the one that you think we should speak on next. 68, Tina, okay. Argument from causal closure. Okay, so going into the writing of Daniel Stoljar where he wrote a paper called Physicalism, um, <clears throat> he says that to try and defend that physicalism is true, there's a pair of arguments at the end that he tries to provide to the reader. The first one was causal closure argument, and the second one was the argument from methodological naturalism. Um, so what is the causal closure argument? There's three premises that lead to the conclusion below. And, um, you know, if you can, go ahead and try to type out the, the, the full argument here in the chat, or at least some of the premises, and then I'll um, respond to whatever you're typing. But, yeah, it's from Daniel Stoljar, argument from causal closure, three premises, then the conclusion, there's stuff in there about like, if something has a cause, then it has this kind of cause, blah, blah, blah. So maybe that's enough of a hint to remind you, uh, direct you where you need to go in your notes or book. So let's see if anyone can tell me something about the, the causal closure argument. Hmm. <clears throat> Every event that has a cause has a physical cause. Premise one. Yes. What's the next premise? Whether you can tell me or anybody, the next premise of the argument. Every event that has a cause has a physical cause, and then what's next? Mental events can cause physical events. Yes. Okay. So every event that has a cause has a physical one. Mental events can cause physical events. And then there's this third premise that's, you know, something about how many causes there are for every effect. Um, I don't know how you want to put it, but there's a few ways to say it. There's like the verbatim way of putting it that I just wrote, which is fine. Or you can try and just express it in like a more straightforward way. But let me know what you think the third premise would be. Every event that has a cause has a physical one. Mental events can cause physical events, and for every cause, there's just one effect. That's right, Tina. That's a good way of restating it. I think the original is like, if an event A causes an event B, then there's no other event C, which is different from A and which also causes B. And to be honest with you, even that is a simplification from the actual thing in the book because he uses different symbolism like in the book. Just reading it now. Um, <clears throat> 
He has this. He says, yeah, so if an event E causes an event E star, then there is no event E hashtag such that E hashtag is non supervenient on E and E hashtag causes E star. So I thought, you know, bringing in star, hashtag, and all these other little technical symbols is going to make it more confusing than to just say A, B, and C. So however you say it, if A causes B, then there's nothing else that causes B. It's just A. If, if something is the cause of an effect, it's the only cause of that effect. Now, anytime you report on an argument, it's good not to just sort of like list out the exact wording because that doesn't prove that you thought about it. You'd want to try and discuss the different premises. So in discussing the first premise, every event that has a cause has a physical cause. If something happens in this world, then something physical had to cause it to happen. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. So that's what premise one is saying. Premise two is saying mental events can cause physical events. And that just basically means that you can think of doing something, and then your body will respond. So if I think of, like, snapping my fingers, and then I want to do it, you see that my hand does it. So the mind can direct the body's behavior. That's all premise two is saying. Premise three is then saying that because the mind causes your actions, and because there's a physical cause for everything, then it is the physical brain that's causing your actions, and it's not anything else. The third premise is saying that if it's the brain that causes your behavior, then it's only the brain and nothing other than that. So it's not like there's the brain but also the soul. How could there be two causes for one effect? Since we know the brain is involved, there's no room for something separate from it to also be claimed as another independent cause of the same observed behavior. So everything's physical then. The conclusion, therefore, of the argument is that therefore mental events just are physical events because everything that has a cause has a physical cause. Your mind can cause things to happen physically, so that must be a physical cause. But if it is, then it's the only cause and there's nothing spiritual or not uh, physical about it. Okay, now um, let me think. One thing I would say in general about like as you're studying and preparing, when you look at a big list of questions, you know, you see all these numbers and it seems like a lot. But I think it really helps to break it down and make it simpler to structure your study guide in terms of author or topic. So like I would say create bracketing off to the left or right where you group certain questions together by author. And then you'll start to see that they all kind of have things to do with each other. And that makes the uh, list itself organized into more manageable, larger chunks. Because, you know, there's really only a few topics in the whole class. There's uh, religion, ethics, epistemology, um, uh, mind, time, and that's it. I mean, we barely talked at the end about life and death on the very last day, just a slight bit. Um, but when you look at it by topic and then even by author, it starts to, I think, simplify some of the content for your mind to, to remember it a little better. But anyway, there's still time, I guess. Did Tina, you ask about another question, or is that the same one? No, that's the causal closure argument. So. If there is any time or desire to go into one one more, we can with five minutes left. Or if not, you know, I'll see what you decide and then just go from there. But either we're going to do another one or we're just going to chill for five minutes or we could end early. But, uh, but I figure you probably want to get as much help as you can. So I just leave it up to you. <clears throat> what do you think? We do have, you know, as we've learned, uh, as you know, part two of the review session on Wednesday. And I'll try to uh, make available some additional office time if anyone wants to get the benefit of another session beyond these two. But that's about it. And, of course, yes, I'll be grading the essays that you guys are turning in through the week, and they'll be done and ready by the end of the weekend. So then you can check with me for your grades, and I'll report by notifying you through Titanium when those are all complete so you can get the scores and comments back. Tina, 44, okay. Um, Statues of Daedalus from Socrates, okay. So um, <clears throat> in the ancient Greek dialogue, the Mino, Socrates is discussing knowledge with uh, this general named Mino, and he's getting to the point of why knowledge is more important or more valuable than just having a correct opinion. This Daedalus statue thing is used as a metaphor to help explain why knowledge is more valuable than just having a correct opinion. So let's hear the definition of what is correct opinion in the usage of Plato and Socrates. What's a correct opinion as opposed to just having knowledge? Correct opinion is some of the parts of knowledge, but something's missing. So 
let's hear from you if you remember what is correct opinion, so to speak. <clears throat> A correct opinion is missing something from our three-part definition of knowledge, but it has the other two parts. So just looking at the, the words correct opinion, you can probably understand that that's a true belief. Yeah, true, correct, opinion, belief. So a correct opinion is a true belief with no justification, with no evidence. Okay, now knowledge, as we all know, is a true belief that does have justification. So why does he say that knowledge is better than just having like a, a true belief that's not based on anything? Well, he says it's kind of like these statues of Daedalus. Now, who was Daedalus? He was a sculptor, very well known in ancient Greece, and his reputation was uh, solid because they thought of him as the most skilled sculptor who made the most realistic looking statues, okay? So since he makes these realistic statues, there was a myth that got developed yeah, there, that's correct, Jasmine. We're getting to the point, but we got to walk through all the little details. So with the statue thing, he said it would be better for a person who had these statues to do what with them? What is it about them that he says a smart person ought to do, which would make it a better situation for you? You get these amazing, beautiful, wonderful works of art from Daedalus. First thing you should try to do is make sure to do what to that statue? To tie it down, yeah, with ropes, so it won't run away. Now he says this, he says, if you have the statue with no ropes or with ropes, which one is better? Well, it's the same statue, it's just as beautiful either way, but the ropes add value because the ropes make sure that it can't run away. Now, they believe that the realistic looking Daedalus sculptures were so realistic that if you didn't tie them with ropes, then they would somehow become alive and they would run off on their own when you weren't looking. So then the thing is, they say, use these ropes to tie them to the ground so they can't run away. And the ropes now are supposed to be somehow like an analogy for justification. Because a correct opinion with no justification is like a Daedalus statue with no ropes. It's nice to have it for now, but it won't stay for long. Because without ropes, the statue will run away. And without justification, your true belief will run away from your mind. Like how many questions have I asked some of you? where if you don't actually remember having read it or studying it in the first place, because maybe you skipped over it, you like, you know that I said it or something, but because it's not deeply rooted in your own like knowledge base, you don't have all the facts and reasons why that's the correct answer, you kind of forget it and you need to be reminded again. So when you have justification though, you don't forget those things. So if somebody just um, guesses something is true, like on a test, they're not gonna remember the right answer. But if they know the answer because they have a million reasons why it's the right answer, then they keep that correct answer with them and they will be able to report it any time in the future. So justification transforms a correct opinion into knowledge and it makes it more stable because it locks it down and doesn't let it leave your mind, just like these ropes won't allow the Daedalus sculptures to leave your mind. So knowledge is better than correct opinion because it comes with justification, which keeps it stable and likely to last. Without justification, you won't remember that. And without ropes, you won't be able to keep that statue because it's just going to run off. So that's the metaphor. Statues are like correct opinions. Ropes are like justification. When you base your beliefs on something, they stay with you. When you base the statue with ropes, it stays with you. That's it. Okay, so I guess that's enough for today. That's all we had time for the moment to do. But uh, let's just all be back on Wednesday, okay? And then let's do part two of the review session. Try to come in prepared, look at the study guide, think about which topics or questions on the list that you might want help with if you haven't heard about them yet. And then just guide me through and your classmates through the stuff that you think is most important. And we'll uh, take our time on Wednesday to get even more um, prepared. So then um, that's about it for now. Thanks everyone. Go ahead and say bye in the chat. And when you do, then I'll close our stream and uh, we'll be in touch in the next couple days as we get ready for the final. Okay then guys, have a great one. Thanks so much for your help and for uh, participating and helping with the review. I'll see you on Wednesday and uh, until then, yeah, take it easy. Okay, bye-bye.